continue today in our series that we titled Romans, Jew and Gentile Accept One Another. Uh, obviously a series based on the book of Romans with a, an understanding that's actually a little bit different than what, what's out there when you were reading commentaries. That the theme of this book is comprised in this very practical aspect of it of Jew and Gentile accepting, understanding, and supporting one another through all of the theology that we see in this book. So we have traveled and explained and labored with difficult passages. And today we find ourselves in chapter 8 of the book of Romans. We have made great progress, but this is only the halfway point. And in fact, here Paul is beginning the conclusion of this section of the book. So, this section of the book began in chapter 3, about verse 20, 21, and it goes all the way to the, the, the end of chapter 8. In chapter 9, 10, and 11, we know he is going to turn to the status of Israel given the official leadership rejection of the Messiah. That will be another way of contributing to this understanding between Jew and Gentile, to this acceptance of one another. In the meantime, we have a, an extremely important text here in chapter 8. We're only going to cover four verses today, so we will be back in this chapter as it has uh, much more to say. But we have to understand that as a chapter, here Paul is beginning his conclusion, he's giving his conclusion, but in the first four verses, he begins, he establishes, he makes a statement, introducing the conclusion that is the whole chapter. So it's, it is important that we understand the first four verses as, as Paul seeks to establish the principle on which he's going to base the rest of this chapter. And we're going to find it in verse 1. In verse 1 of Romans 8, when I invite you to come with me, he is going to state this principle in, and as you get to Romans 8, 1, I want to share with you the, the title that I'm giving this message. I think what Paul is talking about here is being in Messiah to fulfill I think that's what he is talking about here. That the concern of living a Torah-led life can only be accomplished by being and finding ourselves and understanding ourselves as being in Messiah. We know the phrase very well, in Christ, the, the riches that are ours expressed in this little phrase, in Messiah, in the sphere of his accomplishment, in the result, uh, results of what he has done, of his work, and in the understanding of the implications of his death, burial, and resurrection. And so he begins this chapter, this concluding chapter, and he begins this chapter by making this uh, foundational state. And he says in verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in the side of Yeshua. There is now no condemnation for those who are in the side of Yeshua. You know this verse, you know the passage. I want to put it in a context that is going to help us understand the implications of it. So this is his, the principle that he is saying, that those who are in Messiah are free from condemnation. This statement actually, first of all, goes back to some of the things that he said in chapter 5. So I want you to come with me to chapter 5, verses 16 and then verse uh, 18. So Romans 5, 16, he says, Moreover, the gift 
It's not like what happened to the one who sinned. Uh, the, the one who sinned is Adam, right? And the gift is the gift of salvation, the gift of justification. Free is a gift. So the gift of justification is different than what happened to Adam. For what happened to Adam, the one on one hand, the judgment for one violation resulted in condemnation. This word condemnation here is the same word used in Romans 8.1. When it says, therefore there is now no condemnation, it's the same Greek word. And it is good for us to be reminded of how this condemnation came about. It was through the one act of Adam. The only is it based on your personal sin and unrighteousness. But as we were born, we had already lost this game. We were already under condemnation because of the fact that we are descendants of Adam. So it resulted in condemnation, but he is going to elaborate here in the rest of this uh, section. On the other hand, the gracious gift following uh, many transgressions resulted in justification. We'll get into that part later. Verse 18, he repeats the same word, the same thought. He says, so then, through the transgression of one, Again, a reference to Adam, condemnation came to all men, to all of humanity. We became under condemnation through Adam's sin. Likewise, through the righteousness of one, of Messiah, of Yeshua, came righteousness of life to all men. We're going to return again to this phrase and explain because of. Uh, the greatness of this phrase cannot be overstated. So here's the principle, here's what Paul is saying in this principle. He's saying that in Messiah, believers are not condemned, but justified with righteousness of life. Did you catch that, that phrase in 518? You read it here again, the second half. Through the righteousness of one, came righteousness of life to all. Righteousness of life. You ever heard that phrase? Righteousness of life. You know, when you, when you pause and you think about it, you're, you have to realize that. You have to admit righteousness of life. That's not even what it says. What does that even mean? Righteousness of life. Is it righteousness that gives life? Is it righteousness that results in life? Is it righteousness that comes from life? To which I say, all of them are and then some. <laughs> See, in the Greek language, when you have a construction like this, words related by this little word of, the this, of, that, one of the options that you have, which I think is the right one here, is that it means A, which is characterized by B. So in this case, it would be righteousness, which is characterized by life. The essence of which is life. And therefore, it gives life. This justification, this righteousness, that makes people not only just and righteous, but actually overflowing with life. And it so happens that that is precisely what we needed. Because we were dead. Dead in our sins and trespasses, yeah. Ephesians says. So how appropriate it is that the righteousness of Messiah accomplished this justification, this uh, infinite of life, this righteousness of life, characterized by life. That is the principle that Paul is establishing here, that in Messiah, believers are not only 
free from condemnation, but they are actually uh, overflowing with love, infused with so much life that it defeats the death that is in them. What an amazing opening to this concluding chapter in this section. He has labored hard, as we see it from chapter 5. And so now in chapter 8, he is ready to seal this with tremendous statement after another of the accomplishments of the work of Messiah on the cross. We are free from condemnation. We have been justified and overflowing with life. But you know, Paul, he's not going to just leave it there. He's going to explain and then he's going to elaborate on the explanation. And you usually can tell that he's doing that through one little word. And the word is for. That's his way of adding explanation upon explanation and elaboration over the explanation. So let's take them all. Verse 2. Let's see what he's going to add as a way of explanation in verse 2. Uh, so if verse 1 was the principle stated, then verse 2 is the principle explained. So here's how he explains the principle. Verse 2. For the law, what law are we talking about here? So we got to read it in context. What are we talking about here? For the law of the Spirit of life in the sight of Yeshua has set you free from the law of sin and death. So this is not the call. Remember, we explained last week that in Greek, this little word can also mean the principle. A, uh, a reality that, it, that applies to us generally and, and globally true. So the principle, the principle of the spirit of life, and here we have this a similar phrase, right? We, we read about the righteousness of life, now we read of the spirit of life. So here we, again, we can think uh, uh, in those helpful terms of the spirit which is characterized by life, the spirit who infuses and ministers life. He himself is life, and everything he touches, he brings an infusion of his life. This is the spirit of life. So the spirit of life, wherever he, he operates, he infuses people with life. That is a principle that we can take to the bank. That's what Paul is saying. For, he's explaining, this principle of the spirit of life in Messiah, in Messiah Yeshua, has set you free. It makes sense that if the spirit infuses with life, well, one of the manifestations of life is freedom. Freedom. So it is it, it, it is congruent with the spirit that those uh, whom he touches they experience freedom. So this principle of the spirit of life that has set you free from the principle, same word, of sin and death. This principle that whenever you sin, the wages of sin is death. What you receive every time you sin is a form of death. It isn't always a physical death. You see it with Adam and Eve, right? The day that you sin, you will surely die. Well, they didn't die physically, but in the way that they began to relate to one another and relate to God, out of fear and mistrust and blame, you know, things that we see on Facebook every day, right? <laughs> Fear and mistrust and arguments and blame and problems. Uh, this is a manifestation of death. Sin, this is a principle 
the principle of sin and death. Sin that leads to death. Sin that brings a, a form of death. This is, this is a, a great way to, to measure, to understand, to discern if what I'm saying is from God or not, if what I'm doing is from God or not, if what I am considering doing, the decisions that I have in front of me, if it is from God or not, that's what brings me to death. I know for sure if it brings me death, it's not from the Spirit of God. So I can say no to it. I can politely decline, I can retreat myself, I can find another way, another relationship, uh, uh, bring correction to whatever I'm facing, whatever, whatever it, the, the conflicts may be. We can, we can tell that it is not from the Spirit of God if what we experience from it is death. The Spirit of life sets you free from this principle of sin and death. That is why there is no condemnation in, in the Messiah. You see how the explanation supports the principle. The principle is in the side of no condemnation. Because this principle of the spirit of life sets me free from sin. Sin and death is what leads to the covenant. This, uh, this is something that we see that we saw in chapter 7. We didn't actually speak on this passage that I'm about to read to you. Well, no, actually, we, we did. I, I digress. I'm remembering my own sermon. So. In Romans 7, verse 21, we read about this principle and, and, and we, we get a, a, a greater understanding of the implications of what he's saying. So in Romans 7, 21, it read. So I find the principle, again, the same Greek word, that it can mean Torah, or it can mean law, or it can mean prison. Right? We know that the Hebrew word never means law, it means teaching. But I'm speaking of the Greek word. So this is a Greek word uh, used by Jews when they want to signify either the written Torah, the oral Torah, any laws from government, or any principle uh, that's applicable. So, 21. I find the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. Remember, good and evil. Right? Good is that which makes me fruitful. That which makes you fruitful. Evil is exactly the opposite. Another way that we can uh, make decisions and discern whether something is from God. Does it make me fruitful? Do I experience life through it? Then it's from God. The opposite is not. So I find this principle that evil is, is present in me. The one who wants to do good. Verse 22, for I delight in the Torah of God with respect to the inner man, inside of me, my desire or my intent. But I see, verse 23, a different principle. Same word. They translated it differently, but it's the same word. I see a different principle in my body parts, in the members of my body. I see this principle in my hands in my eyes, in my tongue, the way I speak, the things I, I go back to see, the things my eyes delight in, the things that my feet take me to, and my hands want to do. I see, I see this principle in the members of my body, in my body. 
I see this principle. Battling against the principle of my mind and bringing me into bondage under the principle of sin, which is in my members, in my body. It gets a little deeper here. I call this the 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 this is a, a psychology. This is biblical psychology because you are speaking about the immaterial part. But specifically of a believer. It's, it's far more complex. The unbeliever has no concern. They don't want to. They don't have an inner man that desires to please God and to do good. They have a conscience and, and, and a sense of what's right and wrong. A society works better when unbelievers want to do right than not. The battle that we have in our culture today. But the believer is far more complicated because the believer has this new nature inside that wants to do good. So now we have this battle in something between these two principles. The principle that I want to do good and then this principle that I find in the members of my body uh, that bring me to bondage to sin and leads me to condemnation and death. How can I be free from this? Paul says in verse 24, Miserable man that I am, who will rescue me? Who will set me free from this body of death? Here again we have, uh, one more time, this favorite expression of, or, or grammatical expression that Paul uses, the A of B, the body of sin. Who will deliver me, set me free from this body of sin? Again, this body which is characterized by sin. That's what that means. Who will deliver me? And he concludes chapter 7 that way. But then quickly he begins chapter 8. Because the answer to this is in verse 2 of chapter 8 which we are considering here, that the principle of the spirit of life in Messiah Yeshua is what sets me and you free from the principle of sin and death. The question that he asked in chapter 7, that's what he's answering in chapter 8. It's great news. It's great news. There is a way that I don't have to be a slave to this principle of sin and death of the nation. So, here's what we have so far. He established a principle. The principle says that in Messiah, every believer is free from condemnation, experiencing righteousness, which is life. Through life, believers are set free from condemnation. And then he explains uh, that life has set us free from death. Uh, this is the reason why there is no condemnation. This is the reason why there is no condemnation in Messiah. Because in Messiah, I experience this life that sets me free from sin so I'm free from condemnation. And then Paul says, but wait, there is more. Because he's going to write verse 3 in which he's going to elaborate all the explanation. So we have the principle stated, the principle explained, and now we have the principle elaboration. So verse 3 says, for what was for what was impossible for the Torah, and here he actually means the Torah, what was impossible for the Torah since it was weakened on account of the flood. Oh, what are we saying here? The Torah was weak. It's really serious. Are we saying this? Are you okay with this? <laughs> well, we gotta we gotta read well. We 
we have to be good readers. See, he's saying that the Torah was weakened on account of the flesh. The Torah is not the problem. The problem is my flesh and your flesh. That's what makes the Torah weak. Let me put it this way. It frustrates the intent of the Torah. What the Torah wants to accomplish, it cannot do because we are the weak link here, our flesh. Amen. So, he's elaborating, right? He's saying that, well, what is it possible for the Torah, since it was weakened on account of the flesh, God has done. Amen. That's what he's saying. God has done what was impossible for the Torah. What is that? Well, he says, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as a sin offering, he condemned sin in the flesh. That's what the Torah couldn't do, but God did. Amen. Through the sacrifice of his son, who died as a sin or purification offering, right? If you've been with us uh, in our Torah studies, which is based on the Torah. The Bibles, chapter 4. So, what's the same? <laughs> If the explanation of the principle answered the question, why is there no condemnation? Now the elaboration is answering the question, how, how are we set free from sin and death? That's what he is elaborating on, on the how. How is it that we are set free? How does it work? And his answer is through Yeshua's purification, okay. sacrifice. Okay. You know what that's sin offering, right? But we know better than that. It's a purification offering. That's what we see there in verse 3. That he became, he came as a man looking like a sinner, but being as far as possible. From it. it took a human form in order to die. And in doing so, he condemned sin in the flesh as a human being. What is it exactly that the Torah wanted to do but couldn't do? We say it in almost every prayer that we say in Judaism. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments. The goal of the commandments of the Torah was to sanctify. That's the goal of the Torah. To sanctify. So what is it that the Torah wanted to do but couldn't do? To sanctify us. Uh, to infuse us in such a way with so much life that it would defeat the death that characterizes our flesh. Did you get that? The Torah wanted to sanctify us by infusing us with so much life that it would defeat the death that is embedded in our flesh. It wanted to defeat the, the, the weakness of the flesh in us because God did that if He defeated the weakness, the sinfulness of our flesh, then we wouldn't sin, be condemned, and experience death. Amen. The Adderall went down. 
So we said this way. To bring that solution. To so infuse us with life that he would defeat the weakness of our flesh that we would not sin, but choose life to the glory of God. Rather than to sin and end up becoming a condemnation and death. The genius of God. The riches of his wisdom and his power. The life that we have in Yeshua, that we receive through his sacrifice, through his purification sacrifice, this life that he has infused in us, effectively swallow up death. That's what life does. It swallows up death. It doesn't send them anywhere. It just eliminates it. It just swallows it up, eats it up. Look at what 1 Corinthians 15 says. Verse 52, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, it says, In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, and you know this verse, right? At the last shofar, for the shofar will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed, those who are alive. For this corruptible, this body, corruptible body, must grow incorruptibility, and this mortal must grow immortality. But, verse 54, when this corruptible will have put on incorruptibility, incorruptibility and this world will have put on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, and he's quoting Isaiah 25 8. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death is swallowed up in victory, and it is fulfilled when we are transformed, when our bodies are transformed into an incorruptible body that is not capable of sinning and experiencing condemnation and death. That is the ultimate goal that God has. He has already transformed us from within. The only thing is that we still dwell in this corruptible mortal body that is weak and frustrates the sanctification intentionality of the Torah. The ultimate solution would be to swallow up all of death, including the death that is in our mortal bodies, to transform our reality, our physical reality, to be the same as our positional reality Amen. in the Messiah. So in the meanwhile, what we experience is a foretaste of who we already are in Him and what our bodies are going to be absent from this death and this weakness of the flesh. We have a foretaste right now. So we have the power of God Come on. to live today in that victory Amen. that he already recovered. That's what he that's how he concludes this first section, verse four. So he has uh, stated his principle, he has explained it, he has elaborated on it. Now he's going to show us the purpose. The purpose of this principle is here in verse four. When it says, so that this is a statement of purpose. So that, uh, as a result, with the purpose of, that the requirement of the Torah might be fulfilled in us. We do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Ruach. Amen. Right, so we need to, again, 
getting to the terms of what he's saying to understand the impact. Uh, the requirements of the Torah. You know what? The requirements of the Torah are actually spelled out in today's portion. Parashat Kedoshi. Be holy, for I am holy. That's the requirement of the Torah. Be holy, for I am holy. What is holiness? Well, we talk, we've been talking about this uh, in a roundabout way. But you know my definition of holiness, right? How I detest the common definition of being set apart. That's not what holiness is. At best, that's the result of holiness. That's the effect of holiness. Holiness is being filled and overflowing with life, being infused with life. That's what it means for God, that God is holy. He is the source of life. Therefore, He is apart from everything that is immoral, unclean, unholy, everything. Because He's so filled with life, He has no part in anything that is death. So by commanding us to be holy, he is saying to us, the Torah is, as Paul is explaining, the Torah has a requirement, an intent, which is weakened by the flesh. But that intent is that we too may be filled with love. Yes. And that life is manifested in love to God and love to people. That's how you summarize the all of the Torah. That's what holiness means. That you love God and you love me. But we also find this phrase, the requirement of the Torah, in prior chapters here in Romans. Because Paul is building a case that is based on what he has already said. So, look with me in Romans 2.26. Romans 2.26, it says, So, if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the Torah, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Remember this word regarded, right, is used, is used of Yeshua. When it, when it says in, uh, uh, in Isaiah that he will be counted among the sinners. And so he was buried in, uh, as a sinner and he died surrounded by sinners. He will be counted as not in reality a sinner. So here is using the same word. He who fulfills the requirement of the Torah, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as if he was circumcised? Remember, circumcision and uncircumcision really means Jew and Gentile. So if he lives, if he lives out the Torah, doesn't he look like he is a Jew? Yes. Even though he is not. Just like Yeshua, right? By dying on the cross, does he look like he's a sinner? Yeah. Yes, he does look like he's a sinner. <laughs> but make no mistake, he is no sinner. Right. So it doesn't say that living by the Torah makes you a Jew. That's not what this means. However, we find here the statement, the requirement, the requirements of the Torah. And what's interesting is that this, this word requirements here in chapter 2 as well as in chapter 8 in the Greek is the same word for righteousness. And when you take the, this word for righteousness and you take it to the Septuagint, right, the Tanakh in Greek, and then you look at those verses in the Torah or the Tanakh in Hebrew, Here's what you find. You 
find the word mishpat, the mishpati. Remember, the Torah is organized in three kinds of commandments. One is the Torah. Actually, today we study in the Vedas of Bible, we study, we read it, and it says, This is the Torah concerning the Pliny and Pliny Mountains. So, the, the term Torah becomes very technical when it speaks of commandments that are called specifically, This is the Torah of, or the Torah regarding this. So, one type of commandment is those commandments that are called Torah in their particular ways. Then the other two are the Chukim and the Mishpatim. The commandments concerning worship, right, do not follow the Chukim of the nations, but follow my Chukim. Worship me according to my commandments, not according to the statutes of the nations. That's the second uh, type of commandment in the Torah. And then the third one is the Mishpatim, is what we see in Exodus 21, 22, 23. These are the commandments that, that concern human relationships, for which you can take someone to court, whether it is a civil case or a uh, criminal case. So that's what it boils down to. The requirements of righteousness of the Torah that manifest in relationships. How do you love people? That's what it boils down to. So, if the uncircumcised loves people, doesn't it look like he's living according to the Torah like the Jews should? Yes, it does. So it boils all the way down to loving people in sacrificial ways. Uh, let's go back to these two verses that we read earlier. Romans 5, 16 and 18. I promise you I was going to come back to this. In 5, uh, 16, it says at the end, the second half of this verse says, but on the other hand, the gracious gift following many transgressions resulted in justification. Same Greek word translated requirements. The requirement, the righteousness required by the Torah. It is given to us free as a gift which we call justification. The justification makes you a righteous person. to empower you to actually live like one. And then verse 18 uh, is really, really powerful here. The second half, it says, Likewise, through the righteousness of one. What is that? Who, who, who is this talking about? Who is the one here? The righteousness of one, of course, is Yeshua, right? It's the righteousness of Yeshua. But is it? Is it uh, his Torah observance, his righteousness, the fact that he loved people? Or is it speaking about one righteous act? Remember, condemnation came through the one disobedience of Adam. So justification comes through the one righteous act of Yeshua. And that act was that he gave his life. He so loved the world that he gave his life. He died on the cross. So this righteousness of Yeshua very much falls in line with what the Mishpatim are, what these relational commands are. That he so loved people that he was the uh, showed the ultimate love in which he allowed himself to be killed so that the many may be justified and become righteous. And so 
that then informs our understanding of righteousness. When we bring this back to concluded in chapter 8, verse 4, then we read that the requirement of the Torah, this uh, holiness that is expected, this righteousness, this love of people that is self-sacrificial cannot come by submitting oneself under the authority of a bit of tradition. Far. We are very far from that at this point. There is nothing. Listen, if justification has to be by faith apart from the law, apart from the Torah of God, it has to be apart from the Torah of God. Not because there's something wrong with the Torah of God, but because there's something wrong with me. So it cannot be based on my obedience to the Torah of God. Because I don't. And I can't. And I refuse to. I rebel against the Torah of God. So, rabbinic imposition and, and yoke has absolutely no way of producing this kind of result. This kind of righteousness required by the law, by the Torah. But there is one who can, and that is God. So it has to be God who provides the power and the foundation for, right, for the righteousness required by the Torah for this sacrificial love to people required by the Torah to be fulfilled in me. And that's why he concludes verse 4 by saying, Showing this righteousness of God. 
to living out this victory, this infusion of life that defeats the weakness of the flesh. How is he, is he leading you to apply that into your life so you can live that thing? Is it in the way that you speak? Or the way that should, you should speak? Is it in the way that you forgive? That you overlook and you forgive? Is it perhaps in the way that you deal with difficult people? Is it in the way that you deal with difficult circumstances around people? How do you love people who have difficult circumstances with them? It's easy to love the people who do not have difficult circumstances with them. They're easy to love. They're not high maintenance. But what about those who are? How can you love them in a way that is sacrificial? Yet wise, that respects your own boundaries, but also does not hide behind the boundaries. This kind of dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit, because of my position, because of the victory of my position in the signs, this kind of life. Is an emotionally mature life. Is a theologically mature life. It is a sacrificial kind of life. It is practical and it is victorious. When we're filled with the Spirit of God, this is what He does in and through us. And that's how we live a Torah certain life. Not in the power of my obedience because of my weakness in the flesh, but in the power of the Spirit of God, filled with the Spirit of God, based on the work of the sign of the cross. That's Paul's point. That kind of understanding, that kind of living, brings unity between Jew and Gentile because each one understands their position, is humbled by their reality, their weakness, and their sinful reality, but it is also depending on the same Spirit of God for the power of their life.